Glad you could join us today on Etfal. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayola Kasim. Conflict drives hunger, and when that turns to famine, we've been told, then hunger and famine drive conflict. Within the last few weeks, the United Nations Secretary General has been urging Security Council to do more. He linked conflict and hunger by simply saying, if you don't feed people, you feed conflict. At the end of 2020, more than 88 million people were suffering from acute hunger due to conflict and instability, a 20% surge in one year. And 2021 projections point to a continuation of this trend. That's according to the United Nations data. Conflict, climate change-related emergencies, and the economic impact of COVID-19 are making the situation even more dire. There is no other place where this place out more than South Sudan, a country that should be full of hope 10 years after gaining independence. Instead, it's now in the grip of a massive humanitarian crisis with a hard to reach areas in six counties at risk of famine. Intense conflict from the first half of 2020 in Pibok County was followed by severe floodings, triggering mass population displacement and loss of food sources. Farmers could not cultivate their land and many lost their livestock to AIDS or disease. Mother of four, Nyal Mon, is one of the victims. I was desperate when the floods came. No one helped me. My husband was killed in the fighting. Everyone in the area fled and I was left alone with my children, but I chose to stay behind. The fear of being homeless and my children having to beg for food was greater than my fear of floods. A hunger crisis looms where 7.24 million people, around 60% of the country's population, is increasingly hungry due to chronic, sporadic violence, extreme weather patterns, and the economic impact of COVID-19. Many are losing hope fast. When the food is finished and the pots are empty, life becomes very hard for us. The World Food Program began scaling up its emergency food assistance last year in six counties in South Sudan, where one million people live, including 108,000 people who are extremely food insecure and struggle in a desperate daily quest for food. In January 2021, WFP reached 195,000 vulnerable people across six counties, where it must meet people's most basic needs before the lean season takes hold and families on the brink risk tipping into famine. This year, WFP plans to reach over 5.3 million people in South Sudan with food and nutrition assistance across its emergency, nutrition and livelihoods programs. Like this. This village of about 8,000 people uh, wouldn't survive if it weren't for the World Food Program. And hopefully, if we can end the conflict and work with the tribal leaders and the villagers here, then we can build dikes and harvest the water such that we won't even have to be here uh, again. And, but right now, it's barely surviving. If we weren't here, there's no doubt that children, people would be dying. There'd be, there'd be famine right now. In 2020, it reached more than 5.2 million people to boost the local economy. It has since injected more than $50 million in cash-based transfers, helping people to purchase their preferred foods. The economic impact of COVID-19 pushed people deeper into poverty, and millions of families struggle to put food on the table. The future of South Sudan depends on real peace and stability. While the causes of hunger are many, the biggest driver is conflict leading to displacement and loss of livelihoods. Political conflict, compounded by economic woes and drought, has caused massive displacement, raging violence and dire food shortages. Millions of its population are displaced either inside or outside its borders. 
The crisis continues to be a children's one, with more than 65% of the refugee population under 18, including 66,000 children who have been separated from their parents or usual caregivers. While some progress has been made in implementing the latest peace agreement, humanitarian and protection needs remain high for the largest refugee situation on the African continent. Today we are talking about 2.2 million South Sudanese refugees in the neighboring countries. And a major chunk of this refugee population is children. We are talking about 1.4 million uh, South Sudanese uh, children being refugees. The amount that we have asked today is going to help the refugees in the five neighboring countries, uh, but also the host communities that have been hosting them so generously. The COVID-19 pandemic combined with climate change related challenges, including severe flooding, droughts and desert locusts have compounded an already dire situation. COVID is not only a health crisis, it's a crisis of livelihoods as well. So with livelihoods disappearing, we are seeing food ration cuts, refugees and host communities not having enough to eat and us not getting enough funding as humanitarian agencies mean we cannot do much for these refugees and their host communities. The needs are dire and immense from health, shelter, food, water and sanitation and they need the world's help as soon as possible. Funding is urgently needed to provide life-sustaining assistance including shelter, access to safe drinking water, education and health services. Food shortages are particularly acute with insufficient funding already leading to ration cuts impacting hundreds of thousands of refugees. With the pandemic taking a toll on social economic conditions for both refugees and host communities, this year's response includes a renewed and increased focus on resilience and supporting livelihoods. The 2021 South Sudan Humanitarian Response Plan was launched on Tuesday, the 16th of March, aiming to reach 6.6 .6 million people including 350,000 refugees with life-saving assistance and protection this year. The plan requests $1.7 billion in funding to enable UN aid agencies and partners to deliver life-saving assistance to the world's youngest country. South Sudan is facing its highest levels of food insecurity and malnutrition since independence 10 years ago. The South Sudan Humanitarian Response Plan for 2021, which is being launched today, aims to reach 6.6 .6 million people with life-saving assistance and protection this year. The Humanitarian Response Plan has identified 8.3 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, including refugees across the country. This is an 800,000 person increase in absolute numbers from the 7.5 million people in need in 2020. Violence and localized conflicts in many parts of the country also drive up humanitarian needs and the impact, again, of COVID-19 on markets, services and people's ability to move around have increased their vulnerability. South Sudan is expected to see devastating flooding again this year. Last year and in 2019, flooding affected almost one million people. So the upcoming lean season uh, in South Sudan from May to July is likely going to be the most severe on record. And the immediate priorities in the response plan uh, are to sustain the deliveries in the most food insecure areas and prepare for this upcoming raining season, which could again be devastating. The World Food Program has painted an equally grim picture in South Sudan due to a toxic combination of escalating conflict, climate change and COVID-19 that could spell a hunger catastrophe for millions of already vulnerable people. Approximately 7.2 million South Sudanese have been pushed into severe food insecurity due again to sporadic violence, extreme weather and the economic impact of COVID-19. 
Now, this figure includes over 100,000 people who are in those hard to reach areas of six counties who are at risk of famine. They are literally one step away from famine, according to the Famine Review Committee's report. The World Food Program has started to pre-position food stocks again ahead of the rainy season to ensure that crucial food assistance reaches the most vulnerable populations without delay during the lean season. While some progress has been made in implementing the latest peace agreement, humanitarian and protection needs remain high for the largest refugee situation on the African continent. The crisis continues to be a children's one with more than 65% of the refugee population being under 18. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan and Uganda continue to host South Sudanese refugees and to take steps towards their inclusion in national systems. South Sudan is facing its highest levels of food insecurity since the country declared independence 10 years ago. 60% of the population are increasingly hungry. And food prices are so high that just one plate of rice and beans costs more than 180% of the average daily salary, the equivalent of about $400 here in New York. Chronic sporadic violence, extreme weather, and the economic impact of COVID-19 have pushed more than 7 million people into acute food insecurity. When a country or region is gripped by conflict and hunger, they become mutually reinforcing. They cannot be resolved separately. Speaking to the United Nations Security Council, Mr. Guterres warned of multiple conflict-driven farmings globally, with climate shocks and COVID-19 adding fuel to the flames. At the end of 2020, more than 88 million people were suffering from acute hunger due to conflict and instability. I must warn the Council that we face multiple conflict-driven famines around the world. Climate shocks and the COVID-19 pandemic are adding fuel to the flames. Without immediate action, millions of people will reach the brink of extreme hunger and death. Projections show hunger crisis escalating and spreading across the Sahel and the Horn of Africa and accelerating in South Sudan, Yemen and Afghanistan. There are more than 30 million people in over three dozen countries just one step away from a declaration of famine. The Secretary General informed the Council that he was setting up a high-level task force on preventing farming, led by UN Emergency Relief Coordinator Mark Lecoq along with World Food Programme. This task force will include representatives from the World Food Programme and the Food and Agriculture Organization. And it will bring coordinated high-level attention to famine prevention and mobilize support to the most affected countries. All countries face some economic strain as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The solution does not lie in cutting aid to starving children. The disappointing outcome of last week's high-level pledging event on Yemen cannot become a pattern. I ask all countries to reconsider their responsibilities and their capacities. The relatively small amounts of money involved in humanitarian aid are an investment not only in people, but an investment in peace. Other interagency standing committee members will be involved as needed, including the World Health Organization, UN Development Program and UN Women. WFP estimates that at least 34 million people are knocking on the door of famine. These looming famines have two things in common. They are primarily driven by conflict and they are entirely preventable. With modern forecasting, improved agricultural practices and effective humanitarian organizations, natural disasters are no longer plunge populations into famine. But make no mistake about it, man-made conflict is the real culprit. The Security Council has a moral obligation to do everything in your power to end these wars. But until we can achieve that, we need you to give us the funds to stop millions of people from dying from starvation. We were able to avert famine in 2020, and we can do it again. Please, don't ask us at the World Food Program to choose which starving child lives and which 
one dies. Let's feed them all. During a Security Council meeting in February, French President Emmanuel Macron said, in recent years, the world has recognized that in order to protect the environment, climate change is fully a peace and security issue. He said the link between climate change and security is complex and undeniable, adding that one of the 20 countries most affected by conflict, 12 are also among the most vulnerable to climate change. Mr. Macron said that after an extreme climate event, humanitarian measures need to be put in place and urgent measures need to be put in place to ensure a lasting rebuilding. He called for appointing a United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Security to coordinate efforts. But very clearly, the link between climate and security Clearly, the link between climate and security, if complex, is undeniable, in some ways inexorable. According to what's written of the 20 countries the most affected by conflicts in the world, 12 are also amongst the most vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Clearly, a failure on the climate front calls for conflict prevention and peace-building efforts. That's why I support the initiative of taking up these issues with the Security Council as part of its mandate of maintaining peace and international security. You see, it's a structured agenda, an agenda of prevention and effectiveness, which justifies that it is on one hand taken up by the Security Council and on the other hand justifies us supporting the nomination of a special envoy for climate security. However, Russia and China questioned whether the Security Council is the right forum to be discussing climate change. We agree that climate change and environmental issues can exacerbate conflict. But are they really the root cause of these conflicts? There are serious doubts about this. We need to vigorously pursue sustainable development. Climate change is in essence a development issue. Sustainable development holds the master key to solving all problems and eliminating the root causes of conflict. The international community should help the countries in conflict regions, least developed countries and small island developing states to build capacity for development. Countries are encouraged to make climate response part of their economic and social development plans and take multi-pronged measures for parallel and coordinated progress in economic growth, poverty reduction, job creation, health promotion, ecological conservation and climate response. U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry warned that climate change is the biggest security threat that modern humans have ever faced. Some argue that climate change isn't the business of the U.N. Security Council. Well, we could only wish that that were true. But the fact is, the climate threat is so massive, so multifaceted, that it's impossible to disentangle it from other challenges that the Security Council faces. We bury our heads in the sand at our own peril. It is time to start treating the climate crisis like the urgent security threat that it is. This is literally the challenge of all of our generations. We are today. British naturalist Sir David Attenborough warned world leaders that climate change is the biggest security threat that modern humans have ever faced, telling the UN Security Council. We are today perilously close to tipping points that, once passed, will send global temperatures spiraling catastrophically higher. If we continue on our current path, we will face the collapse of everything that gives us our security. Food production, access to fresh water, habitable ambient temperature, and ocean food chains. And if the natural world can no longer support the most basic of our needs, then much of the rest of civilization will quickly break down. 
please make no mistake. Climate change is the biggest threat to security that modern humans have ever faced. I don't envy you the responsibility that this places on all of you and your governments. We have left the stable and secure climatic period that gave birth to our civilizations. There is no going back. No matter what we do now, it's too late to avoid climate change. And the poorest and most vulnerable, those with the least security, are now certain to suffer. Well, the world's struggling to cut planet warming emissions fast enough to avoid catastrophic warming. The United Nations will stage a climate summit in November in Glasgow, Scotland. It will be the most important gathering since the 2015 event that yielded the Paris Agreement, when nearly 200 countries committed to halt rising temperatures quickly enough to avoid catastrophic change. The November summit serves as a deadline for countries to commit to deeper emissions cuts. The UN Security Council has got to act too because climate change is a geopolitical issue every bit as much as it is an environmental one. And if this council is going to succeed in maintaining peace and security worldwide, then it's got to galvanize the whole range of UN embassy, uh, agencies, organizations, uh, and into a swift and effective response. If we don't act now, when will we? The Paris Accord aims to cap the rise in temperatures to well below 2 degrees Celsius and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid the most devastating impact of climate change. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres pushed countries, companies, cities and financial institutions to make ambitious commitments to cut global emissions. China and the United States are the world's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. We still have a long way to go, and we look to the major emitters to lead by example in the coming months. This is a credibility test of their commitment to people and planet. And it's the only way we will keep the 1.5 degree goal within reach. It is clear that the world will need to produce more food and that key resources are limited. Agriculture has high impact on the environment and the climate. Moreover, climate change affects and will continue to affect how much food can be produced and where. Who gets to produce what and where is a socio-political question and is likely to become more controversial in the future. The global competition for these essential resources, especially with the pending impact of climate change, is driving developed countries to purchase large patches of agricultural land in less developed countries. Such land purchases and climate change impact raise questions about food security in developing countries in particular. Food security is not only a matter of producing sufficient quantities of food, but also of having access to food of sufficient nutritional value. This complex problem requires a coherent and integrated policy approach to climate change, energy and food security. Faced with climate change and competition for scarce resources, the entire food system will need to transform itself and be much more resource efficient while continuously reducing its environmental impact, including its greenhouse gas emissions. Even before COVID-19, the world was no longer on track to meet the SDG of eliminating hunger by 2030. Matters have gotten much worse since then, with climate change and conflict being major drivers. In solving the climate crisis, experts say you are solving people's food problem, but if you don't feed people, you are simply feeding conflict. That's our program for the week. Thank you for staying tuned. We hope to be back with you next week. From me, Ayola Kasim, and the Edfire crew here in Lagos, it's bye for now. <laughs>